So just welcome if you're here on the recording. Um, we're starting this food resilience program and we're looking at, we're going to start off by just looking briefly at food insecurity and the work you're doing uh, to tackle it. I'm giving an introduction. My name is Dave Patterson, the Unity in Poverty Action and the Leeds Food Aid Network. So food insecurity is defined as the disruption of food intake or eating patterns because of a lack of money and other resources. There'll be other definitions on that, but ultimately you can't afford to eat properly and healthily. And that is how we would define food insecurity or food poverty. Some people prefer different languages. Some people prefer food insecurity, a little bit less stigma type. Um, but yeah, there's obviously different ways of explaining that. And that's one definition. Um, but ultimately, in response to food insecurity, um, there are different responses to this. And you're part of that response. Um, and, you know, there's three different responses as far as I can tell. So there's the kind of um, the providing help. Um, through different forms of food aid provision to meet this need. There's then tackling the root causes of food poverty and insecurity so that people have more money in their pockets and therefore do not find themselves in a position of food insecurity. And then the final one is basically doing nothing at all, which is, you know, just letting food poverty happen. Um, sometimes people will critique um, various policies that are in place because they'd say that's what it's kind of happening. I think government policy is quite complicated, personally. Um, but yeah, it's there. They are the three responses, and you're usually part of the top one, and hopefully the second one. The second one's a lot harder, tackling the root causes, going further upstream to make sure there's more money in people's pockets. Um, but they are part of the response to food insecurity um, that a lot of us are part of. So one thing I really want to encourage as we set a baseline is this: Are you as a food provider? I really want to encourage that at the Food Aid Network, we really do want to encourage you to value different forms of food aid provision. And you will have your own particular way of doing stuff or that you're involved in, but that might be different from others. So I've just got a list here of different things, go, you know, different forms of food aid provision. We strong encourage, there's a strong encouragement to value different forms. So traditionally, if you went back three, 400 years ago, the parish pantry, you know, we've got Richard Dimry on, on the call here and he's involved in um, being a vicar. But traditionally, that would be a massive thing for local communities. You go to the vicar and say, can you provide me some food? And they'd have a pantry of stuff, a larder, if you like, of stuff to provide people. And that's a really important form of, of basic informal food aid provision. Um, the street outreach, you know, cities have existed in town centres for years and years and years, going back decades and centuries. You know, people have gone out on the street, often linked with a homeless community. And linked to that is the food drop-in model. So I, I'm part of St. George's Crypt, where yeah. people drop in, pre-pandemic anyway, where people drop in to basically find, um, you know, have a meal and sit there. At the moment, the place like the Crypt, you walk in one end, you stop off at two stations, and then you go out another. But that's a, a form of food aid provision. Um, the food bank model, which has been the biggest model, which has grown exponentially over the last uh, 15 years, um, is a really key one. That's usually by food, you know, food parcel provision where people take food parcels back to their house and it's done by referral, a really important part of food aid provision um, that's happened. Really interesting that the food drop-in and the food bank model during this pandemic have been combined together quite a lot um, as people can still drop in without a referral sometimes to access um, support. And I very much support that during a pandemic. What you do in pandemic recovery, what we're talking about now may be different. But we're just trying to set a baseline here. There's also certain forms of social enterprise, the pay as you feel model, where people are actually trying to raise a little bit of money. And also the new pantry model, where the, the food pantry is not quite the same as the parish pantry, but where you put in, say, £3.50 and you get £15 worth of food. Um, these are different forms of food aid provision. And then there's stuff around holiday provision, which is going on. I've just been part of a conference going on right now on Teams, which is looking at that different forms of uh, holiday provision. Leeds has done an awful lot. The government's now investing huge amounts in this alongside activities, that's another form. And we put in also social supermarkets, which work a little bit like um, food pantries where you again contribute and you can go and select different items. And social supermarkets are good for choice. They really do extend that. So what, what the basic message I'm giving you as an introduction to this is value different forms of food aid provision. It's really important. In addition to that, how do we tackle root causes um, as we move forward? It's so important that we look to do this. Um, and so easy, you know, it's one of the hardest things to do. But, you know, one of the things we want to develop is developing debt advice and advo debt advocacy. So debt advocacy is where literally an agency like Christians Against Poverty or 
citizens advice literally will take people's money and they are then the advocate with the creditors to make sure that people can deal with their debts, get more money in their pockets and be able to buy good food. Tackling um, you know, health issues and addiction issues is massive because that takes money out of your pocket, which then reduces the amount of food that you have. Um, you've then got job clubs, which is um, really important. How do you find people work to put money into people's pockets, which then in turn means they can buy good food. The development of on location support is really important. We're really wanting to get money buddies, for example, and, and different agencies back into food banks so that they can give advice on the spot rather than to signpost people is something that we want to develop. Cash grants, big thing around cash grants going on at the moment. You know, should we can, we, can we give cash to people rather than give them food? And there are some pilot work going, hopefully going to go on in Leeds. And then healthy start vouchers. You may know that healthy start vouchers are increasing in value from uh, £3.10 per voucher to £4.25 so that a, a, ch a child can get health, um, some more healthy food through that voucher. And again, it's just trying to put more money, if you like, into food so that people can buy it, either through themselves or through our Healthy Start vouchers where it actually buys it for you. Um, I've not got long left on this, but I just want to say that um, here's a little diagram. Now, what you can see, we want to see collaboration and connection. So in this, you've got different forms of food aid provision in the middle. You've got food pantries, food banks, food drop-ins, street outreaches, social enterprise. We want to see people signposting effectively this arrow here. So from the NHS, job centre, housing, faith groups, individuals, welfare rights, signposting effectively to these people. We then want to see people signposting people effectively on so that they can deal with addiction issues, find work, volunteer or pay, get training, education, get connected with local community groups, deal with their longer term needs and aspirations, you know, get to the job centre and deal with their benefits. And then at the same time, you've got distribution of food. We want to see food distributed effectively. So Fair Share Yorkshire and Rethink Food done a fantastic job during the pandemic at distributing some of you providers um, so that you can provide. And also there's a whole thing around individual shops, um, food suppliers and supermarkets distributing food. A lot of that was made up in the pandemic and why there's been so much food is that food has been purchased um, to provide um, what people have needed. Um, so that just gives you hopefully a little bit of an idea of the values that we want to set, the connections we want to encourage you to make. The final thing I want to say is this, when developing food provision in response to the pandemic, we encourage all food providers to benefit those who need it most, working to the principle of providing a substantial amount of your own food. Um, and that's really important. So as, as a lot of people have benefited from the whole structure that the city has set up through purchasing food through the council, Rethink Food Fair Share, that will start to wane. So if you want to carry on, particularly if you want to carry on beyond the end of June, how can you supply your own food, a good amount of it, and then have it topped up by fair share and rethink food? Just laying down that kind of principle that we, we can all try and work to. Encouraging discussions regarding what level of access individuals can get. How much can people access recurring support? It's the massive thing. Should someone be able to get 52 food parcels a year? And what are the, the, the issues around sustainability and their own dependency in that? So that's something we can talk through, work through. Um, look at pre-pandemic patterns such as how much um, recurring support is offered through meals rather than food parcels. So the community kitchen model, which hopefully will restart June, July time, um, that's really important. And often the way that what people do um, when they're trying to offer recurring support, so that the crew can get a meal every day, great. It's not the same as getting a food parcel every week, which is actually probably more expensive. I've gone on probably far too long, but I just want that, that just gives you a, a bit of a broad brush there in terms of giving you a basic of food provision, value in the different forms, and looking at how we tackle root causes and the immediate um, provision, and look at the pandemic recovery. Sonia, over to you. Great, thank you, Dave. Okay, so um, thank you, everybody. Um, it's really great to have everybody here this afternoon for this really important conversation. And I just wanna talk a little bit about how we as a city develop a food vision, a vision for building food resilience for the city. So I am the coordinator of Foodwise Leads. Foodwise Leads is a, a partnership, the food partnership for the city. Um, we are the driving force for good food in Leeds. And what we do as a partnership, so as a partnership, we're made up of, of, of lots of different partners, be they third sector, council, universities, business, individuals, all working together. And what we do is we want to encourage people to grow, buy, serve, and eat healthy, sustainable food, and to help build a locally focused, high quality, 
low carbon, zero waste, and above all, a fair food system for our city so that everybody is included, that we all work together. And I feel this is the, um, we feel that this is the real, the, the, the foundation with what we need to build on today when we talk about food resilience. Um, everybody has really worked fantastically over the past year to come together for this incredible response. And now it's, what do we do now? How do we move on? How do we continue to work and support people? So what we've got here is some principles and practices for resilience and food security and nutrition as laid out by the United Nations for the Food and Agricultural Organization. And this is what they've come together for like really, you know, crisis, famines, but actually the principles work very well here um, in, in, in Britain at this time. So what's really important is local leadership. You know, the people in the communities, we need to work together, but we need to have leadership um, if we want to improve the security, food security. We also need a multi-stakeholder approach so um, we, we need to be, yeah, we're working with the different partners across the city in different ways and in, in different places because every need is different, but making sure we've got this, everybody working together for the same objective. Also combining crisis and longer term options. We will always have that safety net for people in absolute crisis that will not be removed. And I think it, it just sums it up really well here. Resilience building is a continuous, and long-term effort that addresses the underlying cases of vulnerability while building the capacity of people to better manage risks in their lives. So it's about supporting people to make the changes and, um, and be, be more secure. Also, we focus on the most vulnerable. It's absolutely key that they're, they're the, the focus of our, um, the work that we do. And the last point, it's just about you know, mainstreaming risk sensitive approaches. It's about um, evaluating and reviewing the work that we're doing. We're, as we've experienced over this past year, situation changes very rapidly. And it's important that we um, you know, evaluate and understand where things are and move together. Now in Leeds, um, um, there's, there's a lot of a focus put on asset-based community development. So A, B, C, D. And this is um, an approach that the council is leading on. And many of you will probably be very experienced practitioners in this form of work. And the basis of this is that we need to focus on community assets and strengths rather than the problems and needs. It's when we're able to build with what the community has, then you know, we can build in resilience. So there's five key building blocks to ABCD and that being asset based. So an asset is the people that, you know, the, the, the organizations, the buildings, the skills, the individuals that make up that community. It must be community led. The community communities must find the, the solutions themselves. So as we are based in different communities, this is really an approach, good approach. It must be relationship oriented. It has to have that real personal and people to people um, support. And inclusion, everybody, no matter what the background, no matter what the um, challenges they're facing, must um, involve everybody in this approach. And place-based as well. So within communities, you know, with communities, um, communities doing what they need to do. So I think the, the real importance of when we're looking at this ABCD um, um, approach to building food resilience is that it empowers communities and it also gives confidence, confidence to the, the providers of food aid and also confidence to the people that are receiving food aid as well. And then an, another approach that I'd like to include in this is a bit of possibly new terminology for many of you, and that's food citizenship. And this is the direction that as FoodWise leads as a food partnership for the city that we're moving in and we want this to encourage the city to come along as well. So food citizenship explores the idea that we're not just consumers at the end of the food chain, but participants in the food system as a whole. We have rights, we can exercise our rights, and this is, this is something we must need to do. So when we're considering food citizenship within um, food resilience, it's about using positive language Look, looking at the ABCD as well, like building on the assets and working with people. Um, it's also inclusive once again, you know, just really 
everybody has a voice and everybody's voice should be heard. And it's about food justice. So, you know, everybody should have access to food. It's a basic human right. And together as a city, we need to achieve this. And once again, it's empowering as well for, it's empowering for the individuals, but it's also empowering for us as citizens of Leeds that we're developing a stronger, more sustainable food system that everybody is able to benefit from. So it's with these sort of considerations and thoughts I'd like to take us on to a uh, first little activity. It's called a Mentimeter. So I want to capture what people are thinking, what they thought about this, the presentation so far. So if I can ask you to grab your mobile or another device, so not the computer that you're on. And if you go to www.menti.com, you'll see it at the top there. And type in the code 11639511. See the code there. And then just put in words that you're thinking. You know, what does food resilience look like? You know, what does food resilience in Leeds look like? So, and then the words will start to appear. We'll have a few minutes for this, so don't feel stressed. So you get to Mentimeter, type in your code. So one, one, six, three, nine, five, This just helps to create a really nice image of Have we got any more coming in. That's really nice. There's lots of words. dignity, collaborative, confidence, community, hope, sustainable, healthy. And even just some of these smaller ones are lovely, like grateful, enough for all, anxiety. Inequality. So it's really fantastic. We'll just leave it for just one more minute. And then what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going into breakout rooms. Dave is going to send us out into uh, different breakout rooms for a while. And we'll be discussing things in more detail and really trying to capture your, um, your insight, your experience, your you know, thoughts of, of about how we, can, how can we can create more food resilience in Leeds. I, I just want to say that in Leeds, we're, we're sort of leading the way on this as well. We're one of the cities that is sort of leading the way and trying to think of this, you know, post-crisis and, and the stability and sustainability of moving forward. So it's, uh, it, it's really very interesting. And once we've got this, our toolkit prepared, I mean, this is a resource that we'll then be able to share with other places around the country. So it's, it's really a valuable piece of work that we're doing, not only for Leeds, but for many people across the country. Are we allowed to ask Sonia how, how resilient do we think Leeds is? That's a very valid question. I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts on that. Very unanimous audience so far. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think you raised a really interesting point in your presentation, Dave, about um, 
you know, providers pro being able to provide their own sources of food. I think that's um, really interesting and not, you know, that we, you know, I just want to reiterate again that we've had an incredible supply of food um, over the past year, um, but it, it's not always going to be that way. So it is really about making that mind shift and that, you know, that, you know, a re it's a reality that has to be taken into consideration. Uh, what are the questions, Emma, that they've got to work through? Uh, all the facilitators should have them um, on the webinar plan. Um, but we there's a, f a couple of different ones that we're going to work through. But we, as we said at the start, we're going to look at uh, strengths, opportunities, uh, weaknesses and threats. Uh, what do you see as the strengths and weaknesses in the way that food poverty is tackled? What do you see as the biggest threats to your service, the community or your food provision in the wider um, context of your project what opportunities are there and we want you to frame this in thinking about the COVID impact your availability of food we'd love to know more on, on who is accessing and the presenting issues and how food is utilized by projects and customers also considering the sustainability as well so quite a lot to cover but just a very rich conversation to be guided by however people want to share so I just wanted to um, bring everything back together and summarise the next steps just so that um, you're all clear how your contributions will be used and how you can co continue to contribute moving forward. Um, so there is a steering group that's leading the development of the toolkit. Um, and we will continue to meet and continue to capture feedback. What we're going to do today is the, the leaders of this workshop or this webinar are going to come together and just have a chat about the different questions that provoke the most discussion. We're going to look to then put those into a survey and send that out around a wider group of food aid providers so that we can capture um, additional information from people who weren't able to join us from today. Um, we're considering how we can capture case studies and learning on a regular basis and certainly what came out strongly within our webinar was the opportunity to have time like this where we can talk about how we work together we can talk about learning and we're going to build on that and um, if you are interested in being a consultee for the development of the toolkit please do um, contact Gail her details are just in the chat um, her details are just in the chat here and um, Gail Graham at Zest leads.org.uk um, and we can put you on a list so that we can circulate drafts of the toolkit to you and involve you in that um, and we are hosting a second webinar on the 21st of April which will be bookable via a eventbrite that will be released shortly and the aim of that is to share good practice amongst food aid providers and look at how the projects have developed their provision from food parcels into other models and we are looking for willing projects to speak about their experience um, thinking about some of potentially some of the people who were in my route my group who were doing things around meals might want to come forward but no no pressure um but just trying to um showcase all the different varieties of practice that are out there um, and look at how we build on that so if you are interested there's my contact details and you can contact me and we'll be looking to get that invite out probably over the next uh, week or so and the toolkit itself will be available in june we are hoping that the toolkit will be a really, really useful resource to form an induction tool for a lot of volunteers who give their valuable time to support food aid providers in the city and support projects. Um, we're also hoping it will be a really logical document to help you signpost to the range of different services that service users might require. So that might be around financial inclusion. It might be around other food support needs it might be about employment and a whole host of other things so just really keen to continue this discussion and if there's anything that you feel is specifically pertinent please do um contact me directly because um, i can feed your thoughts into the steering group uh, i just wanted to finally say just a massive thank you to everybody who's been involved in pulling this together um, thank you to Sonia and Dave for, for opening and taking us on uh, some thinking around building food resilience and um, if there's any questions at all, um, we're willing to take those for the last few moments.